massive fan of Bruce Lee, like absolute legend for me. They say working on some script ideas. He had a headache, she gave him some pills. And number three, kick the shite out of them. That's not a good deal, is it? You know, because we're all we're all gonna lose people that we love. Buddhism is about learning how to not be so affected by the winds. Chris, how are you, sir? Hello, mate. Very well. Thank you for having me on the podcast. I'm a big fan, Chris. Big fan of your show. Oh, well, it's that's um, that's just an absolute honour to hear. I'm... I'm always, um, I'm not really good at taking compliments. I've watched your podcast. I like it. I think it's great. I think it's a real brand. Um, it's, it's very clear and definite about what it is, Chris. And you're very clear about your message, you know, get out there and venture like life's worth living. And I love that message that you put out. Um, you were saying about um, there's no such thing as a bad experience. I think that's really empowering, mate, to be honest. And I think that's really, really important for, for not just young men to hear, but um, all, all men really and, and and women of course but i'm just talking from my own perspective um people who get out there you're here crediting me i've just been listening to your work on buddhism what yeah. is it the buddha said he said you know you fight anger with happiness you fight yeah you fight it's all about transmuting isn't it it's like about transmuting emotions chris you know um I, I, and that was what attracted me to it very much um, <clears throat> I think, I think essentially, uh, Buddhism and the study of it is about it's about helping people find their place in the world. I don't think it's about telling people what to do or what to believe. In fact, my Buddhist teacher, first thing he said to me is, "Don't believe a word I say." He says, "Run it through your own common sense first. If it makes sense to you, then investigate it. But don't just believe it because I'm saying it." Um, and I, and I thought that was like really profound. You know, he said, get it off the paper, go and, go and live it, go and experience it. And um, so it's certainly been a source of comfort and help through, for me through my life. And it's definitely changed the way I do things, look at things and act and react. And then it kind of matures over the years. And I'm not trying to say I'm anything special, but, it, it, you know, the more you study and the more you practice it and think about it, um, it does kind of start to become what I thought was a better framework for living your life, you know? Yes. So there'll be many people listening who probably don't really know what Buddhism is. I mean, I, I only know because I've spent time in the Far East. Um, mm. I'm, I'm not saying you have to spend time in the Far East to understand yeah. what Buddhism is, but for me, I, I had to. And it yeah. was very simple things like my, um, my sister-in-law was Thai. Yeah. Um, is, or is Thai, I should say, and um, to see her attitude towards things, which is completely different from, from ours. So, for example, acceptance, you know, mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. accepting all, all, all people and all difference, that, that was a sort of eye-opener. Um, I was wandering through Singapore one day, Chris, and we, we got to a, a Buddhist temple I've actually, funny enough, I put the photo of it on my Instagram today, if anyone's oh, okay. listening. It's, it's this, yeah. um, I don't even know if it's a Buddhist statue. It might even be, 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 be no, it's Hindi. It's like this oh. cat looking, per I, I can't <laughs> even remember, to be honest. But anyway, yeah. so I'm walking past this temple with a local Singaporean. And he started to, you know, do some sort of like prayer ritual. Uh, out of respect and and he turned to me and said uh ah chris what religion and i said i don't have one he went ah free thinker right <laughs> and and i thought you know what yeah. you've just hit the net that is exactly what i i I don't want to be slept. My family, we, we came out, we fought our way out of slavery, the thralls did, right? I don't want to go back there. Right? <laughs> so, 
but but again this very accepting you know there's him he's doing mm. his you know uh, but when yeah. i said no i don't do any of that he's like oh wow he just had great respect for me and yeah yeah and yeah i think in that sense chris it's more like a philosophy than a religion i think it should be i think it really is actually a philosophy rather than a religion so it's like take you know you, you don't have to like worship and in fact in zen there's a saying which is a, like a it's actually a chinese that eventually became Japanese version of Buddhism. There was a saying that says something like this, Chris, there's 10,000 uh, statues of the Buddha in the world. Each single one will be a hindrance to you understanding what Buddhism is about. So it's saying, don't, don't worship eff effigies, you know, don't worship things. Don't do that. Just think, you know, just think, calm yourself down, meditate, understand your own mind a little bit better. Um, and that, you know, and there's a bit of direction and guidance. There's no, you know, uh, there's no commandments, if you like. There's no, you must do this, you mustn't do that. There's, there's, they say there's ways to live your life better, that are better for you, that create a better life for you. And certainly it created a better life for me. Um, but there's no sort of, you know, it's not hard and fast. They don't shove it down your throat. And there's, you know, I think it's quite a peaceful, t tolerant uh, philosophy, really, actually. Yeah. It's interesting, Chris, isn't it? Because I think anybody that's, the gone down the path to enlightenment has followed the Buddha's story. And we'll, we'll, I'll let you explain to people what, what, what he was a prince, wasn't he? And, and he, and yeah, but when I look at my life, in fact, can you tell us about, was it Prince Siddhartha? Was that his name? Siddhartha. Yeah. So basically um, sort of to just uh, I sh sort of paraphrase roughly the story is that, um, he was a prince and um, his father wanted him to become a king. Um, and he left the palace. I forget what age it was, maybe 25 or something like that. He left out the palace and prior to him going outside of the palace, he'd never seen death or old age. As the story goes, he'd just been completely showered with like every luxury you can imagine. And then he came out and he saw in the streets um, old people like dying, sick and poor. And he was like, oh, what's this? You know, can you imagine, can you imagine the privilege, you know, having never seen anybody old or poor. Um, and he was shocked by it. And then he, he, um, he wanted to try and understand it. So he went, he went and studied in the forest and studied with like wise men and, you know, starved himself and meditated for extended periods of time until he um, came up with a, a formula of understanding about the cycle of life and death, basically. And um, again, to cut a long story short, because you could talk about this for, for, for years, really, but he, he said, um, right, um, life contains lots of suffering that we don't understand. So there's the suffering of age, so suffering. there's the suffering of being born. In fact, there's a lot of suffering when someone gives birth and when you're born, uh, the suffering of age and the suffering of like actually acquiring material goods and being separated from them. So you acquire things, you get attached to them. Like my master said to me, well, imagine you buy a yacht. Is that a good thing? I was like, wow, a yacht. Wow, that's an amazing thing. And he said, but what about when you're not with it? Are you worried that someone might steal it or it might rot or get damaged? Well, yeah, yeah, of course. Well, that's a kind of suffering. So he, he talks about like, he talks about the, the subtle sufferings in the things that we think are um, not suffering, right? Um, and, then, and then he talks as well about understanding that as a way to set you free. And when you understand your suffering, um, the sort of little bits that you deny in your mind, you, you, you change the way that you act and then you change the way, just naturally, you don't have to force it, you then change the way you act towards other people because like in your life, Chris, you've had a lot of suffering. You've had a lot of hard times. And I'm sure that built a lot of empathy in you to understand other people's difficult times. And so I think I'm not, I mean, I, I didn't actually know we were going to talk about Buddhism on here. I thought I'd, I'd have read, read a few more books and like come up with some clever words to try and impress you. But I think essentially it's, it's talking about just understanding, being empathetic and kind, but not from a place of where you have to be coming from a place of like just understanding yourself and then trying to understand other people. So that's, I think, essentially what it, what it is in that, you know. In order to step out of the matrix, uh, which, which I refer to as 
setting foot down the path of enlightenment or even indeed being enlightened, does it require a traumatic experience? Maybe even a traumatic childhood experience is the requisite you know, not to say you can't become understanding or some people aren't just genuinely yeah. nice, nice people, da, 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 but to actually see the truth in life, which many people find really hard. I know people, they're not in the, they've got, like they've stepped out the matrix with one foot. Mm. They're in this brave new world. No, no pun intended. Um, or no reference intended. Um, they're realizing, ah, that old world, yeah, it's not, it, it, that shit doesn't work, right? Yeah. But in order to try to make sense of this new world, a aka enlightenment, they're using the old school rules, right? Mm -hmm. So they'll say, you know, we got to fix the planet, we got to fix it, we need to vote in this guy. <laughs> and it's like, no, no. <laughs> You can't fix a corrupt system using the same corrupt system. It's not really sense, you know. It's so hard, though, isn't it? Because the system's so all-encompassing and it's so big and it supports everything that you've been told from year dot. I mean, it's a bit like a kid realising that Father Christmas doesn't exist, isn't it? Yes. It's like, I mean, wait, Father Christmas doesn't exist? I've been lied to? What? Um, but then you still carry on giving presents and you still perpetuate the same... You know, I would say lie, it's a harsh word for you for your own kids, mm. you know, to keep them in the system. Can you imagine, like, um, you, we, you've got kids, I've got kids. Can you imagine your, your kid, when they're five-year-old, you're going to, there's no Father Christmas, and I want you to go tell your mates, it's all a big lie, and um, I'm not buying you anything for Christmas. They go to school, they tell their mates that, and they're like, what the hell? Everyone's, <laughs> everyone, like, you almost do it just to keep fitting in with everybody else. You know, you have to, the system is designed so that, um you know, it, it keeps you in, it keeps you in. Yeah. Um, and you have to have some degree of, you have to have some degree of like, you have to have, you have to kind of have one foot in it to survive, you know, to, to pay the electric bills or whatever. I'm, I, I'm, I'm on the same page as you, mate. I, I like, I've, I've long thought that we are, you know, we're like slaves building pyramids, really. Um, you know, the big banking system and everything. It's like, you don't own your house, mate. You, what you do is, you go out and you slave for somebody else so that you can pay the slave master so you can rent that thing that in 25 years you say is yours. Um, yeah. And and then woe betide anyone who drops out of that system. Even when it's yours, when you die, then your kids or whoever you leave your property then have to pay a third of it to the sociopaths, you know? <laughs> it is funny, though, it's isn't it? It's a perfect system, isn't it, Chris? If you're in charge, mm. you know, yeah. you know. There's a, there's a saying in Taoism, uh, a, a, an analogy that springs to mind. It's like uh, a drop, like you think of a wave on the sea as the wave's going forward and, you know, you get gets the, the top bit, the white bit, the crest of the wave. And then on the t crest of the wave, there's little drops of water that come off the, off the wave and they come off the wave for a little while. And while they're separate from the wave, they say, hey, I'm separate from the wave. I am a drop of water. I am all alone. Mm. But then give it a few seconds and they join back with the ocean and they become part of that wave again. So that reminds me of, of that, Chris, for a brief moment, we think that we're separate from the universe. And then we, while we're separate, we think, well, I'll do this. I'll do that. I've got to do that. I've got to find out who I am all the time, not knowing that they're actually part of the wave. Mm. And not knowing that there isn't anything to, s <laughs> it, it's crazy. You have to, I've had to travel the planet and do every single mental stuff that I possibly can to realize that I actually didn't need to do any of that. And that peace is in my head and that I am, like I say, I mean, insignificant. And I mean that in a good way, you know, mm. I don't have to attach any bloody importance to myself. You know, I don't have to achieve any, all I've got to do is just maintain some kind of equilibrium in my life and, and open my eyes and appreciate it and do a few crazy stuff because after all we're life experience in itself. So why not throw yourself out of airplanes? If, if that floats your boat, let let's go back to your history, Chris, where did Hong Kong come into it? 
Um, I guess I was about 17 uh, years old, 17, 18 when I went out there. Uh, oh. I've been doing martial arts a long time. Yeah. Go on, yeah. I, I, I thought for some reason you'd grown up a lot younger. Can you tell us where your surname comes from? Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm half Irish, half Italian. So my father's Italian, uh, my mother's Irish. Uh, so that's my, my background. I didn't grow up with my father, I grew up with my mother, and life wasn't easy as a kid. Um, as a teenager, we had a, uh, well, no, I wasn't a teenager, I don't know how old I was, maybe 11 or 12 or something. We had a break and it was fucking horrible, um, you know, and it was like petrol burn the house down kind of, kind of gig, it wasn't pleasant. And that's the first time I experienced the feeling of, oh, fuck, I'm going to die here. I really did think, I really did believe that. And, um, you know, that where you, where you think, oh, I'm helpless, can't do nothing. That's it then, that's my number, is it? That, that's it. There's like that terminalness to it. And that scared me so much, Chris. It really did, it really affected me. And um, a couple of weeks later, a friend of mine says, come down do some Kung Fu. And I was like, that's a load of bollocks, isn't it? I'd done a bit as a kid because my family were involved in it. Um, and I was like, oh, I'm not interested. Anyway, they dragged, cut a long story short, they dragged me down there, started doing the Kung Fu. Um, and just kind of obsessed with it, really. Um, so I really took it to heart and it gave me that structure that I wanted, probably something similar to what you found in the military in terms of like regular training, discipline, self-respect. Um, there's a kind of an order and a ranking system. And the more you work, the better you get and the higher you climb and the better you become within that organisation. So I did quite, I did quite well just because I worked so hard. I didn't really have anything else going on. It wasn't the internet then, was it? And uh, from there, I went to, um, I was just started going around all different schools. As a t I wasn't very good at school, I was dyslexic. Um, got a high IQ, but not very good at school. Um, started traveling around all the different schools, getting on the bus and going and trying this school, that school, the other school. Ended up in a Chinese community center um, and kind of got taken in really and taken under their wing. Um, trained there for a good few years and um, then went off to Hong Kong when I was about 17. That's where I got involved in Buddhism, by the way. Mm -hmm. So the guys at the, at the, um, at the, the Chinese community centre were, were dabbling in things that they probably shouldn't have been. Um, and I know that you, you, you know about that sort of stuff. And um, a lot of them went to jail uh, for very long stretches. We're talking... And, um, again... We're talking the organised crime thing as opposed to the drug thing now, right? Yeah, yeah, no drugs, yeah, no drugs. Um, and um, so what ended up happening was, I, again, I was left without anything to do really and without that family structure and, and, and that was a driver for me very much. So I thought, right, well, you know, I picked up a little bit of Cantonese, a few words by then. And I was the only white kid training in, in, that, in that community and um, I went off to Hong Kong and uh, went out there to find some Kung Fu and to carry on training and find another sort of structure for myself, really. And uh, I came across a Buddhist monk. And I'll never forget, I, I, I had, had a chat with this guy. He was sitting in there in his orange robes and stuff. I was a 17-year-old kid from Birmingham, um, you know, quite rebellious, really, as a, as a youth. Um, and I said to him, like, excuse me, mate, can I have a word? And he spoke English. Said, yeah, yeah. I said, what's, what's with the whole, you know, like wearing an orange sheet? Um, no disrespect, but what was it all about? And he said, he said, I'm a Buddhist. I said, what, what's that? And he said, well, he said, Buddhism is like, if you think about it like this, he goes, you know, on a tree, you've got leaves, right? And he goes, the leaves at a certain time of the year, they fall down to the ground, don't they? I was like, yeah. And he said, well, when the leaf falls down, the wind blows it from the left to the right on the way down. I'm like, mm, okay. It's, well, Buddhism is about learning how to not be so affected by the winds on the way down. So what he was saying, Chris, is um, the practice of Buddhism, not the religion, but the practice of the philosophy, like the understanding, the meditation, the study, you know, he says that helps you not, you, you, you're born into the world, you're that leaf, you get dropped into the world and you're going to die, you're going to go back to the earth, right? You are that leaf. The wind 
blows you left and right. The sufferings, the different kind of suffering that you encounter in life, the different, you know, the different things that you do that cause suffering. And he said, so the study of Buddhism helps you not to be so affected by the winds of suffering on your journey. So you can travel in a more direct light, a uh, direct uh, path. So that was what that, so I went to, long story short, so I, I, I went to Hong Kong and then I was quite taken by that. And I was like, wow, that really makes sense. And I think that's kind of what I'm looking for. So I started studying that as well as the Kung Fu out there in Hong Kong. And I found a great teacher who was a really positive human being. He was a good man. He was a member of um, the community. You know, in fact, his dad was knight, um, not knighted, he got a CBE or something from the Queen. But they, they were a good, a, a good organisation, very positive, and they worked with youth uh, in Hong Kong. And that was, that was a, 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 a change of um, environment for me, Chris. And um, the Buddhism got me into reading more and studying more. Um, and then I eventually, eventually sort of came back and went to, to university um, and did a, a, a degree in, in Chinese in London and over in, in Beijing as well. Beijing, yeah. So kind of led me in a different path. I don't know if our friends at home can see that one. That I believe that's the Buddha, isn't it? That it's the one, Buddha, and then when you turn it, it goes to Guan Yin, yeah. Is that the prince, or is it? I don't know what that... No, so basically, the first one is a, is a Buddha, and that's brilliant. I've got to get one of those. Is that like a fridge magnet or something? I, I'm going to explain <laughs> it, because what you've just said made me... I've just got it out of my wallet, but, but go on. So Guan, Guan Yin is the goddess of compassion. So she's popular in Hong, Hong Kong. You'll see a lot of Guan Yin. Do you get in Hong Kong? Have I just given myself bad, bad luck because I thought she was a bloke? No, no, she wasn't listening. <laughs> In fact, I mean, there is some story. No, no, uh, Chris, there is some story that that, that um, I don't know what you call it, saint or something like that in English, I suppose. I think she was a man, but then turned into a woman because she had so much uh, compassion oh, for... I was a little some, bit right then. There. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I... Um... And I want to let's let's go back and talk more about Hong Kong because that fascinates me that we've trod the same, you know, we've trodden the same street. Yeah, yeah. Um, no, I was just I think I just got off the um, Star Ferry and was make, wait, making my way into Kowloon. Yeah. And one of the orange robed said orange robe monks came up and I, do they go like like that or some, something? And and. I've got this stage in my life where sometimes I just can't be asked to say, no, I don't want to give you my money. So I just went, all right, how much do you want? And he went, so I gave him a hundred Hong Kong dollars as well. It was about a tenner, isn't it? Tenner, yeah. And, and then he went and he gave me this and he, he gave me this little flippy thing of the Buddha and this, um, this man girl. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and ever since this was 2011 so for 11 years i've carried that in my wallet um for good luck i'm not saying i'm massively superstitious but i thought why not i'll i'll keep that for good luck and my my dreams will continue to keep coming true and of course they they have but so 17 years old in Hong Kong, I was 25, so a bit older than you when I got there. What year were you there? Oh, let me see. Uh, 90, I guess it was probably ni early 90, maybe 1991, something like that. Oh, so you guess, there before yeah. me. Yeah, I guess, yeah. And which area did you live in? So I lived all over. Um, initially, I was in Kowloon because that's where the school was. Um, and then I, I went up to, um, I started, I'd run out of money, basically. So I started living on, um, over in the west side um, on Mount St. Davis, which is, they had like a youth hostel on the top of the mountain there. And it was like two quid a night or something you could stay there for. So I was over there for a few months. Do you know that place? No, Fantastic. I'm just, uh, I wish I could have found a place for two quid a night when I was I know, mate, homeless. I know, because it's really dear isn't it? It's oh, really man. expensive. It was a schlep though, I have to say, because I'd have to get up at like four o'clock in the morning. It was about an hour down, it took me about an hour and a half to walk up. And then you'd have to walk down to the town, get a tram and then get a bus. It would take me like three hours to get to my teacher's school. 
So, and then of course, there's no food up there. There's hardly any electricity actually. So you come up at the night, end of the night, you're walking up for the mountain at night time. It's pitch black for an hour. And um, if you go, oh, sh- I haven't got any food. I didn't bring any food. Just walk back down to the 7-Eleven. It's like an hour and a half down to get a pack of noodles, you know? So, it, 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 <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it's one of the best times of my life. It's really, really happy up there. It was really fantastic. So I was there for a while. Then I've lived back uh, a few different places as well. I've learned, uh, lived over in uh, Chen Chao in the island, the island, one of the islands. Um, yeah. So, yeah, all over, really. How many years did you stay there? In Hong Kong. Mm. Hong Kong, uh, altogether, like, probably, if you added it all up, probably a couple of years. Yeah. Um, because I went there after uni as well. I started working out there. Did you get... While. Did you get into Wan Chai much, into the nightclubs? I, I didn't, actually, to be honest. Um, but um, I, I do know of the area. I might have been there once or twice. Um, I know it was kind of... I was more like, to be honest with you, I wasn't really into the... I wasn't really mixing with the expat community. And I know a lot of the expats spent a lot of time there, um, a, a, as you did. But it wasn't really a... Like, if you've got to get up at four in the morning, man, you can't really go nightclubbing, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. do what I did. Just you just stay up all night. There is that <laughs> for for nine nine days on end. And uh, actually, no, don't do that. <laughs> Doesn't have a good, great result. Yes, it's got a very bad reputation, hasn't it, one try? You know, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of trouble there. Although it certainly was, you know, um, back when when we were there. Yeah, it was just it was interesting. I'm. I had two different Hong Kong experiences. The very first time I ever went there, which was I was there for like a two week holiday. I just didn't get under the skin at all. I was wandering yeah. these big streets. And I, to be completely honest, I couldn't have told you whether I was on the island, Hong Kong, Hong Kong Island, or whether I was a mile away across the sea on the mainland because the, the, the under, in fact, I didn't even use the underground system because I didn't know they had one. Right. Or I, I, I was, I was a young traveler. So I, I just thought you got buses and taxis to places. Right. So everywhere I went, I just jumped in a cab and I went under the Harbor tunnel, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of the time I was realizing, I don't actually know which part of this crazy, huge, vibrant metropolis am I in now? Well, Chris, it was a different time scale, wasn't it, mate? Because, you know, they didn't have, you didn't have Google Maps and you didn't have, like, the internet to read, or oh, where am I now and where's a restaurant. Maybe, I didn't even know what a guidebook was when I went out there first, did you? It's like, no, you, know, you, get a no. Hong Kong. you just land, don't you, and try and sort it out when you're on the ground. Mm-hmm. And so it's a very different time frame. Yeah. It's interesting you say, I didn't know that there were travel guidebooks until I started traveling in the Americas about, I don't know, let's just say 10 years later. Mm-hmm. So I'd rock up in a place, whether it's Hong Kong, China, Macau, you know, mm-hmm. Thailand. And I'd just say to the taxi driver, well, just take me to the, to the, where's the bar area? Where can I get yeah, it? Where's, where's it happening? I have my little backpack on and that's it. They go, no, no, you, you need a hotel. No, I don't. Oh, right. I want a beer. Take me where, where can I get a beer? And, and, that was kind of like my traveling, but of course I missed out uh, on all the touristy sort of things. Cause I didn't know there were books that told you where all this stuff is. So my first time in Hong Kong, I just, I didn't get it. I, I, I actually started to get bored. It was so tiring walking everywhere. You know, in that eight as well. I, I couldn't, I would go in a restaurant, look at a menu all in Cantonese or in, 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 in Chinese hieroglyphics. Yeah. And I just, I wouldn't know what to order. So I'd walk out again and I'd go in McDonald's. So for two weeks in Hong Kong should be a food paradise. I'm, I'm eating, you know, bloody breakfast burgers or whatever the thing, you know, the egg, the, the egg McMuffin or whatever. And they are good over there though. And they sell lemon tea as well in the McDonald's. Well, that's the thing about Hong Kong, isn't it? That, it has such a huge competition with Cantonese cuisine, which is the yeah. one ne- probably next to Thailand, the best cuisine in the world. If you ask me, yeah. that McDonald's has to be cheap. So you can get, a Mc- yeah, that's right. when I was there, you got a whole McDonald's for a quid. 
right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, because not... they were really trying to push it, weren't they, to really try and get into the market to compete with the Cantonese food. And the Cantonese, like the eating habits, are really strong in their culture. Mm. Yeah, they. You know, it's, it, it's a shame they couldn't have just said that to the big junk food places. But so, when did you get your? When were you awarded your first, or when did you earn your first black belt? Oh gosh, um, you know, um, I guess what you'd probably well, I I tell you what, I was I was first awarded like a teacher status. Uh, when I was, I guess I was 18, probably. But by then I'd been doing it for, you know, five, six years, pretty much full on. So the teacher status, like there's, as uh, I was told to go teach, now, right, now you've qualified, off you go and teach. 18, 19, maybe I was 19, actually. Yeah, I think. Wow. Yeah. Um, in, in which discipline? That was Kung Fu. So um, I, it was in an art called Yao Hong Mun uh, in Hong Kong. And, um, yeah, it's a Shaolin based system that my teacher's father had taught him and his teacher's father had taught him. So it had been passed down through the generations. It was really pretty cool. I think, uh, it's quite a rare style. Um, and it means, can you repeat the name of it? Yeah. Yao Gun Mun. Yeah. In, in Mandarin it's, yeah. In Mandarin it's Ro Gun Mun and it means soft. So the Ro, the Ro character means soft. Same as judo in Japanese, ju, like in Japanese, if you to pronounce it with ju. Uh, yeah, a gung means kung fu, the, the same gung. And then mun, the word mun means door or gate. And it's an old, it's a term that is used before the words like nowadays you've got ch- chuen, like, you know, like kun, like, like um, hung, hunga kun, kun, the style or the fist. In the old days, they'd say mun, which means the, the gateway to. So it's the gateway to the soft kung fu, I suppose it was called. Mm. Um, and it was um, so, yeah. That was that was the first real thing that I um, sort of qualified in to to go teach. Uh, yeah. And can you tell us the history, or perhaps like, you know, you hear this stuff about Shaolin kung fu, don't you? That it was it was taught to the returning warriors when they hid out in the monastery. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, over to you. Yeah, sure. So um, any specific area? Because this is something I'll wrap it on about for hours, Chris. Well, so just, what, the, just so, I mean, if I was to yeah. ask you, Chris, where did Kung Fu come from? How did it originate? Um, what, what would you okay. tell me? Um, so with the Kung Fu, where did it start from? I suppose um, one popular belief is that uh, the monk called Damo, an Indian monk, was travelling, Indian, Indian Buddhist monk, travelled across, uh, on foot to China from India and he landed in the northern Shaolin temple about 2,000 years ago something like that and um, he was saddened he was he was a practitioner of Kal- Kalara- Kal- I always pronounce this wrong Kalaratapiatu so an Indian martial art he landed there and he was so he was doing yoga and he was he was stick fighting and doing martial arts and stuff in India and he thought you know what these monks need a bit of physical exercise so he started teaching there um like yogic type exercise which eventually became shaolin kung fu so that's the popular known about sort of theory um theory of how kung fu evolved but there's another theory which is less proved but probably more realistic so whilst we know all that stuff did happen um it the shaolin temple over the course of its history has also been a hiding place for bandits and criminals. So um, where would you go if you were on the run? All right. So we know that happened and we think that maybe there was some influence from um, those m- people who've done martial arts um, practically, and they bought their fighting arts and shared them with, with the monks in the, in the temple who had an interest in uh, martial arts for life preservation. So it's a bit of a melting pot, really, Chris. Um, we know historically as well, China, because there's records of this, um, there's, there's actual written records um, in, in paintings, cave paintings and text, that there's codified martial arts been going on there for over 5,000 years. There was an art called Jiao, Jiao Ti, and um, I think Jiao Di, and they would like, they'd fight, they, they, they knew th- throws, they knew grabs, they knew locks, they knew headbutts. They'd wear like horned 
kind of antlers and, you know, skewer each other for competition. So we know that codified martial arts practice was practiced there. In fact, as it was in Egypt, you know, we've got uh, the tombs of, I won't bore you with all the details, but tombs of Beni Hassan um, that they found and they've date, carbon dated it, 5,500 years old. There's hieroglyphic works there um, showing um, codified practice of martial arts, which to be honest, looks a lot like judo because there's throws and grabs and, you know, breaks and um, all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's been going on for ages, mate. And I think a lot of people just claim it, don't they? And they say, well, it's ours or it's ours or, you know, for whatever reason they've got. Did it originate as a fighting art or was it like more like a yoga or, a, you know, a meditative kind of thing or a sport? Well, I think it's fight. I think the fighting art, to be honest with you, it was rough back in the day, wasn't it? And um, in the period of cold weaponry, like you know, steel, and before we had guns and explosives and, and stuff, or that the, you know, gunpowder was used in that way. I think um, I think it was much more important to be able to know your way around a, a blade, a bladed weapon. Um, so. Yeah, I think it's just been practical for people to, for guards to protect certain people, to protect prisoners or to, to move prisoners around from A to B to um, to protect gold and the transfer of gold. Historically, those were the sort of jobs that uh, martial arts were were used for. So it's, a, you know, mm. war has been around, hasn't it, Chris, for, since mankind has been around. And then people have wanted to get better at it, better at war, because it's not nice to get skewered, is it? I think, I think that's, you know, do you know what I mean? It becomes codified and then, you know, yes, break off and do their own thing. But ultimately it's all the same, isn't it? Really fighting. And is it true then that, I mean, in Cantonese it was, I think it was gung fu, mm -hmm. gung, gung, they call it gung instead, not not the kung that, that we do in the West. Mm -hmm. Is it true that means open hand or, or originally it did? No, it was, no. That's no, karate, no. isn't it? Karate. Actually, I'll tell you a story. So, yeah, karate, kara, te, te. Te is hand and kara is the Chinese word for kung, means empty. But originally when karate was evolved, you know, karate originally came from China. And um, it was originally called China hand, not empty hand. But then as it transferred, I think, from Okinawa to, which is a lot closer to China, and had a lot of Chinese influence. Uh, when it transferred over to the mainland of Japan, they then changed the name. They didn't want it to be called um, Chinese hand. They wanted it to have a more, a name that would spread better in Japan. Yeah, well, they've not always had the best relationships, those two countries, have they? <laughs> That's putting it mildly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And um, how many martial arts now are you sort of proficient in? What, what is it mainly chinese based ones or is only chinese really i've done a bit of the other stuff as well you know i've done a bit i've mixed and matched a little bit mm. um but essentially it's chinese stuff that i love yeah so i've studied a range of different kung fu's tai chi's and that's what i teach now i teach tai chi i teach kung fu and um but uh, yeah it's the chinese arts essentially i've studied a bunch of different chinese kung fu's yeah mm. it's all the same ultimately there's just different ways of doing things and different flares and different emphasis is really I know I, you, you have a lot of people who come on and they they sort of say when they're talking about martial arts, this is better than that and that's better than that. And, oh, how could you say they're all similar? Well, they are, to be honest, because there's only so many ways you can hit somebody. Isn't there? Um, yeah. You know, dress it up. Do you know what I mean? Dress it up as much as you like, but ultimately that's, you know. I mean, the philosophy has got to be that of Bruce Lee. Is it, is it not be like one be? I mean, you've got to do whatever does the job. And you not mm -hmm. not anticipate what might do the job. You've got to be fluid in that moment. If someone's going to stick a headbutt, probably the most mm -hmm. obvious thing is just like move out the way. You know, what I mean that's the, your first reaction, isn't it? If, if, or avoid it before it comes. You know, if you can read the situation before and you can see him edging closer into your space, you know, make sure that you've got that fence up. You know, that you're at a distance where you don't let them get too close. So let, let's just get some boys own questions at you then Chris so yeah. have you ever had to use it in a real situation yeah uh -huh. tell us what how did that materialize a few times um, a few few times to be honest if you 
this it didn't materialize too well if you see this see this knuckle's gone here oh flat knuckle yeah see that that's all right that one but this one's gone yeah yep um yeah, I was. I got into you know, I got into scrapes, didn't I? As a kid, growing up as a young man, looking for adventure, and not really being, not, you know, being. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say gobshite, but like, I wasn't as a younger man. I didn't really know how to diffuse situations, Chris, and I didn't really know how to, you know, maybe I, I, I didn't know how to really communicate well, and I didn't know how to, to back down really, and to walk away, you know. I think it's lack of confidence, really, um, ultimately, lack of self-confidence uh, as a younger man. And um, so, yeah, I, 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 I have had experiences which, um, you know, resulted in, you know, fighting. Um, for the most part, I've done all right. I've, I've been able to look after myself. Um, but as you'll know yourself, when you find yourself in rough places um, and you're a bit sort of orientated towards finding a bit of adventure. Sometimes you go down the wrong, you know, wrong, you go down the wrong way a little bit in life. Mm. And, um, yeah, so. So, I mean, my problem, like working the door doors in Hong Kong, particularly on this one club that I mentioned, because I had the anti-progression. So I went from being very spiritual, spiritualistic in my door work, which is what you need to be, Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, for example, three six foot two black dudes would be walking down through Wan Chai, three abreast, right, blocking the pavement, blocking the sun, everything. Just yeah. yeah. Right. And um, you know immediately they're American servicemen oh. off off one of the ships in the harbour, right? You know yeah. for the simple reason you don't really see. Back in the 90s, you didn't see many black people in, in you didn't see them yeah. out and about. They t tended to be yeah. part of the, uh, the, um, uh, the immigrant community that hung around Chunky or lived in Chunky mansions, right? The, the, the cheapest. Right. Yeah, uh, yeah. My, my, my buddy Ghanaian, Ghanaian Mark. And um, so these guys would come up to the door. And of course, our club was just an RC club. It had a rule, no servicemen. And, and it also had a rule, no fur and no, no hats. Um, it just had real finickety sort of owners. So, oh, hang on. Hey. <laughs> so I'd just like to do just a little bit, little bit of Kung Fu every now and then to keep my... Um, Keep yeah, my, clean the nasal passages, keep, yeah. Yeah, keep, keep my skills up, you know, because you never know, do you? I mean, you never know. Anyway, never know. so so there I am. i got three guys that are, each of them are twice the size of me. Mm. And they come up to the door and they do the, you know, go to walk in the club and you'd have to go, gentlemen, I can't let you in, I'm afraid. Uh, Why not, motherfucker? Uh, it's... It, uh, uh, could, uh, the, there's no serviceman <laughs> right and I, 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 I that point, went down well didn't it after a few oh years oh my god I'd point to the board which literally had 20 rules listed on it right anyone who remembers Joe Bananas in Hong Kong will know exactly what I'm talking about right there's, they had a board which listed it you know it's almost like things like no boas and it was just I, I got it I got it it's like if you've got too much money and you've got too much power you you can yep. invent a load of crazy shit rules anyway. So how do you know we're servicemen, mother trucker? I'm like, um, because like I've lived in Hong Kong eight months and I've never even seen another black guy, let alone three walking side by side. Uh, in perfect formation. Where, yeah, wearing Georgetown sweatshirts. And with the muscles you guys have got, look at that, look at that. <laughs> and then the guys are, oh, yeah, you know, yeah, I, I work out. And I, I'm like, oh, well, I, I was military. Yeah, I was in the, uh, in the Marines back in the day. Oh, you're a Marine. Oh, do you? Yeah, okay. All right, we're going to go and find somewhere else. Cheers, buddy. Right. And that was it. I, I was a good doorman. You know, I could diffuse yeah. situation. I, I could see stuff happening. I could see trouble. I knew how to go up to a guy and go, you're right, bud. Guy giving you our time, mate. Just, just ignore. Just ignore. 
oh yeah thanks mate you know it's just little psychological techniques mm. to diffuse trouble without having to fight or throw somebody out right um by the time i'd worked through three nightclubs and i was in my fourth one of those nightclubs instantly was a dj of the biggest club in southern china which is just another another adventure again but by the time i got in this triad run club i was so like strung out on the crystal meth that i'd i'd gone from being that nice cozy sort of docile not docile but you know disarming doorman to someone that really felt quite violent and needing you know not i'm not going to take any yeah. shit i'm I, I work with the triads, you know, this guy's a, yeah. an assassin. This guy's a street fighter. Don't come in our club and fuck with us. Right. And the trouble it was, Chris, I didn't know how to fight, <laughs> 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 but I was fearless, right? Yeah. That is a bad combination. <laughs> <laughs> so the next time these, um, you know, next time there's an American or the next American ship that came in, one of these dudes, and I'm telling you, if you're listening, they're like basketball players. They are huge. These African-Americans that man the ships. Not all of them are huge, obviously, but they just have just they come from big stock, you know. So I've got this guy wandering around in basketball kit. I mean, literally had a basketball vest on and he's got a beer that he's bought in the 7-Eleven. And of course, I'm like. Dude, don't drink that. Whereas before I'd go, bud, look, can I just put that down here for you? Just grab it on the way out. It's just my boss. He'll get up. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The guy would have gone, oh, yeah, buddy. Yes. No, instead I'm like, hey, dude, fucking yeah. outside with that. You know, like my attitude yeah, yeah. is changing. Yeah, right? yeah, 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 yeah. And of yeah. course, I, I threw these two dudes, dudes out. And uh, then they, or I threw this dude out and he came back 10 minutes later with one of his mates who was equally as huge. And they stood at the top doorway going, come on out, mother trucker. Come on, we, we are going to kill you. We are going to... And I like being, you know, not never having backed down from a fight. I just wandered up. I started to make yeah. my up the steps. Fortunately, the tri triad big brother, the gang leader, was counting the money at the... counting the takings at the lectern. And he went... This guy never looked at you. He just, what his body told you what to do. And he went, just put his arm out like that. And I kind of stopped. And then the guy's like, come on in, mother trucker. Come on out. We're going to kill. And I'm like, so I went for it again. And the boss goes. And uh, when a triad uh, big brother tells you not to do something, you, you have to obey, right? When you're bossing in under Confucianism tells you anything, you, you have to obey. So I was quite pleased he, <laughs> he intervened um, because those guys probably would have beaten the shit out of me, Chris, you know? Have you ever been in that? Oh, I mean, have you, um, can you give us examples of, have you ever been unfairly picked on where the other guy's not going to back down and you've had to oh, yeah. think. Oh fuck yeah! How did you? How oh, did many, you well, quite a few down? times, mate. Quite a few times. Um, where there's a number of them, do you mean? Or well, whatever. I'm just. I'm looking for a story. Come on, we want some Bruce Lee shit. What? Being a bit evasive, aren't I? Really? Yeah, you're being um, humble, mate. And this um, humble right. was. There's a time and a place for humble, and it's not now. Well, I'll tell you. A, I'll tell you a story that winded me up in um, a uh, Sri Lankan prison, if you like. For a few days it wasn't very long um so yeah i was out there on holiday and um with my girlfriend at the time and her sister and um i don't know if you've ever been to sri lanka it's a lovely country and they do these great oil massages right <laughs> and nothing funny about it but they're quite into their ayurvedic medicine so here i am on the beach having or in the hotel having this massage and um my girlfriend comes running in with her sister and her sister's like got a big massive welt on her head across her face and I'm like well, what are you disturbing my uh, massage for girls I didn't I said what's wrong what's wrong and they said well this guy outside had just um, basically he jumped on uh, one of the girls and tried to sexually assault her plain day on the beach 
And um, the sister had got involved and gone, what the fuck are you doing? Tried to drag him off and he, he picked up a log that was on the, and whacked her across the head with it. And um, again, I was a younger man at the time and, and um, a little bit more temperamental, I suppose. So I went to say, so, right, which direction did he go in? Because it's not acceptable, is it? Doing that sort of thing is not acceptable, right? So I'm not one to get into trouble myself. I don't go looking for it, but I was in quite, a, I was in a very bad mood at what I'd just seen, you know, and heard. And so I went, I went, I went, I went looking for him and I got him. And uh, he was in the next village along. <clears throat> and um, it didn't, it didn't go well for him. Uh, I gave him a bit of a hiding, to be honest. And um, then some banana farmers came down with, with the machetes and all that. Um, and it, it, it got a little bit ugly. It got a little bit ugly. Cut a long story short, I ended up, um, I, I, I knew the police were sort of looking for me. So I handed myself in because uh, they told did me you, the hotel. I went back to the hotel. Did you disarm yeah. the people with the machetes or did you knock them out or something? Or? I, 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 I took out three. I took out three of the lads with this one with this one bloke, right? And um, and then when the machetes lot came, I, I I spoke to them. I said, right, this is da da da. I kind of like I thought, fucking, hell, I'm not. I don't want to get into this. I'd done what I needed to do. I'd spoken to and had words, let's say, with um, with those other guys. Um, and I managed to co- kind of de-escalate a little bit with the banana farmers. To be fair, there was probably about ten of them with big hooked machetes. I'd have been mince me, you know. Um, I managed to de-escalate and get out very quickly. And I went back to the hotel and they told me, you know, um, police are looking for you. So I went, I, as far as I was concerned, I didn't do anything wrong. So I went to the police station and I said, look, I'm here voluntarily. Um, this is what happened. And uh, they decided to hold me because they wanted money. Then they said, well, what's happened is the one guy who did what, you know, you said he did, he crushed his uh, windpipe. So he had to go to hospital. He's in hospital, he's got to pay for it. So, you know, that crushed his, you know. And uh, so I wasn't going to pay, basically. I was a little bit um, belligerent about it. I'm like, I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not fucking, you know, you, you rape, you're trying to rape somebody in midday, a girl, then somebody else gets involved and you hit him across the head, a young woman with a log. Um, I've gone to try and catch him for you. A fight has broken out and his mates have come out. And they've been acted violently. So what am I supposed to do? Two of them tried to grab me and put my hands back. And I was like, I'm not having that. So I, I gave him a good hiding. And um, as a result of that, some the, the chap had got injured with his voice box. He couldn't speak. It was quite funny, actually, because they came down to the station um, after his hospital treatment. He was kind of like, <laughs> speaking like that. And um, <laughs> I have to say, I, I, I didn't feel sorry for him. My normal... <laughs> Buddhist um, empathy just wasn't wasn't really there that day. Um, so, you know, the, the chap was known to the police and it wasn't the first time he'd done it, apparently. So, yeah, I, I have kind of, in my younger days, I have kind of, um, you know, I have sort of um, got myself in, in and out of sort of trouble. But I, 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 would, I was never going to look for trouble, Chris, and I was never trying to hurt anybody at all. Um, but, but certain things, I, I, I feel very strongly that sometimes we have to act um, in certain circumstances, mate, you know. So, yeah, probably yeah. could have handled it a bit better, but, you know. Yeah, I was chatting the other, when I spoke to Steve Green the other day. We, we we were chatting along a similar thing, and that is, in our day, if you were out of order, you got a punch, you know, and then it taught you not to be out of order the next time. Now there's yeah. so many protective measures in place and laws against that kind of behavior. And to a degree, it's quite rightly so. But, you know, there was a reason that you got punched or you punched someone. It's when that they overstepped the mark. And by taking away that kind of, um, that control measure, let's say, you then give people an unrealistic idea of what it is to be in a community. And by community, I mean our, you know, local community, our community as a country or the internet yeah. commu- community, right? So you've got young people now. It's quite funny. You know, they talk to 51-year-old, 51-year-old combat veteran, like you're a piece of shit, <laughs> right? Not that being a veteran means that you 
I know what you're saying. You know, respect is earned. It's not something you just get given because you were in the forces yeah. when you were when you were a teenager, right? But but what I mean is, it's like, dude, I'm I'm like 51. When I was your age, we would never have spoken to you know. No, it's not no. not even like being like abusive or anything. I just mean that like the whole way is like, yeah, well, fuck, you know, there's this kind of. You know, my narrative's just like way more important to me than yours, dude. And, you know, you don't understand it. And it's like, dude, I'm, I'm 51. I've lived in 87 countries. I I kind of like know life probably yeah. a bit better than you. And, 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 and because you've been allowed to get away with this attitude all your life, because no one's ever been allowed to smack you one, you, you, you're living under the delusion that this, this way of being is acceptable and this, yeah. and it, and it's not about the the pain that you're putting out onto others with this belligerent, you know. I can say what the hell I want, you know. It's the fact that you're going in the complete opposite direction of. Uh, I was going to say enlightenment, but probably maybe you'll end up so unhappy that that you won't come around to it. Yeah, you'll 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 do what I did, get so unhappy. You've got to work out enlightenment, but yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? yeah interesting different age different age what about the fighting spears the the, the asagai uh, did i see you doing a, a bit of tv tv work around that you know, uh, like the, in, the, the zulu fight yeah 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 it's, yeah zulu land yeah i went out to film um a show out in uh in in well we were out in durban and then we went out from um out into zulu land yeah and i got to um have a fight with um, who was the tribal champion actually. Uh, he was the son of a son of a chief out there, and I absolutely loved that place, man. Those people are so warm; they're so incredible, so, such an incredible race of people. Mm. So yeah, I got to spend time out there and went to see shamans and uh, witch doctors and spent time with them. Um, and I've, I've done that kind of stuff before, you know, in South America and in various parts of Asia. Um, but yeah, Zululand was incredible. So I, yeah, we had a we had a stick fight. So I um, funny story there if you're interested. I I was um, at the time again. The, 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 I guess when was that man? That was like I was living in South Korea at the time, and my son used to play. Do you, do you remember the Wii? Like the Wii, he had the Wii. Do you ever have a Wii? It's like one of them. Uh, ah yes, yeah. I mean, you know what I mean. That that um, it's like a game. It's like the old Atari, like fucking Xbox or whatever. Yeah. You so used anyway, to... he used to be. He, Chris, he used to be playing this game, right, on, on there. There's this Wii Sports, and it was like, I think it was like Kendo or Stick Fighting. Or, it was Kendo or something like that on there. And you get these hand controllers and you move them around. And um, I was trying to do the research because I knew I was going out there to fight. And um, I was trying to find, like, what, how do these guys fight? I'd never experienced it before. I'd never really seen it. And I got a couple of videos on YouTube which kind of gave you a hint about their stick fighting art, which is really, really cool, by the way. And, um, and and I was talking to my son about it. He was about five or six years old at the time. And he was like, Dad, come on, let's practice on the Wii. This is how you're going to do it. And anyway, my, my six-year-old son came up with this strategy, like on the Wii, that when they hold the, the stick this way uh, on this sword fighting game, if you strike that way, it's going to block the stick, right? So where, whenever the stick's up, you don't hit them across, you hit them down. Whenever the stick's, if, the, if their block is across, then you hit them across, and so I just trained that in and I was, I was trying to move in a certain way so I could take advantage of the way that they, they defend and, and, uh, and it worked surprisingly. Yeah. Very good. Very, yes. very interesting. Incredible. I love all the, the um, African history. Yeah. Yeah. All, all the stuff about the, the Zulu. Sounds unfair saying the Zulu wars, isn't it? It's more like the Zulu genocide. Oh, um, mate. Just yeah. another native yep. population genocided to make way for white European progress. And no, I'm not bashing white European people here, folks. I'm, I'm just, I'm actually talking about history. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, you, 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 it, it's easy to look back at a situation, understand it. That's one thing, isn't it? Like I understand it. You had very, you know, money and wealth orientated settlers arrive on a nation that looked like the land of the continent yeah. and looked like the land of milk and honey, man. 
The only yeah. trouble is, there's some other people living here, but <laughs> their yeah. ways are such di- so different to us. We can kind of like manipulate them for the most part. You know, we'll just give them a load of shit and tell them it's cool. And then if they yeah. don't, if that doesn't work, we'll get the old guns out because they've only got spears and we'll, yeah. that, that will send them a good message. And then of course you encroach more and more on their, their pastoral land and their, their hunting grounds and their ag- agricultural lands that, that they've got no choice but to fight back at which case you massacre them in their thousands. Right. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, it's not, not, it is just the way of the world, isn't it? But the, when you, when you're in Soweto, so the ghetto in, in Johannesburg, the township, as, it, as it's called, you actually are looking at the repercussions of our behaviour back in the 19th century when we had like uh, Rourke's Drift and Isalawanda. Uh, Is- yeah. Is- you know, yeah. you're, you're actually looking at the displacement of these people in their own homeland that are now shoved into shanty towns um they still have their history they still have their spears you know and they still they still sing and dance the tribal songs yeah. but so it, it you know it is a thing it, it it's not like oh that that was ages ago in history chris you know we it's like no it's it's still to this day they're they're the oppressed minority it's affecting and, people yeah it's affecting yeah. people uh all over the world yeah but yeah, I I love you know I've read a lot of Wilbur Smith. He talks about the assegai, the stabbing spear, and the, the you know the, yeah. the shields and the impi warriors and and the horns of the bull was their fighting tactic, yeah. wasn't it? Their pincer movement was called the horns of the horns, yeah. horns yeah. of the bull. Yeah. Can we talk about your television work? Because that's quite um. That's great, yeah. You know, it's quite an achievement, isn't it, to get yourself on TV? Now, now it's the opposite. Yeah. No one wants to be on mainstream media, but right. <laughs> well, very, very, very. I guess Aunt Middleton still does. Bless him. <laughs> Sorry, that sounded really patronising, and I didn't mean it like that. I just meant he's doing really well with it, isn't he? You know, he's he really, doing? really, he's really smashing out the TV shows, and good, good credit to the guy. Um, but. Um, yeah, you've done a lot of it. How did it? How did it come around? Yeah. Um, well, long story short, I suppose um, about two year two thousand. I think I ninety nine two thousand. I came back to the UK. I've been o- overseas for a long time, and um, went to drama school. I started doing bits and bobs in theatre. I wasn't very good, um, and uh, I wasn't paying the bills. I was renting this like rooftop apartment which was an absolute shithole in north london just struggling to pay the bills mate and honestly it was like it didn't even have a toilet in this place this is in north london it was like it was in the, there was like a, a toilet in the bedroom that reeked to piss it was dreadful like absolute hovel and um yeah so i just thought i can't i can't do this and getting odd gigs in theater and stuff so i started um trying to break into tv so i wrote a bunch of formats for tv started pitching them around no one was listening uh knocking on doors and i just thought well i I believe that there could be a show in martial arts on tv and so i started meeting producers going to production houses around london and most of them said the same thing to me it's a niche within a niche it's never gonna you're never gonna do that it's just not interesting uh and then 2003 i've got uh, a job at bbc making the show that, that I'd, I'd um, created, Mind, Body, Kick-Ass Moves. And it was basically, it was like, I, I've done a lot of travelling in my time, done a lot of studying with different masters. That's what the show's about. Uh, so I went around and just filmed with loads of different masters in different countries and see what they did, get, get involved with their stuff. And um, lo and behold, that first one, they played that on the BBC for five years, mate, non-stop, just kept repeating it. Um, it held viewers. It just held the viewership. And um, at the can we, time... Can yeah. I ask you about the money side of it then? What what, sure. what was your... How did you... How was that an earner for you? So, uh, yeah. So basically I got paid as a presenter. So I had three contracts uh, with them. One was as a presenter. Um, I got um, back-end payments as well as the writer. I got a writer payment and I got... Um, 
a creator, whatever it is, I forget the name of the contract, but it basically gave me um, a really good percentage. I forget what it was. It was a really good percentage of international sales. And then the show, of course, um, became one of the best selling BBC TV shows in his in BBC TV history, bizarrely for something that was niche and from BBC Three. They sold it to over 180 countries worldwide. So um, it wasn't kind of it's not it's BBC Three money, so it's not the kind of you can't you can't retire on it. But um, I was able to pay my bills for the first time in my life, you know, and um, you know, uh, yeah. So that, so that did really well. Um, that's how it started, Chris. You know, it's just like uh, perseverance, really, knocking on doors and just saying to people, no, I believe it when they're telling you, no, no, it's no good, it's no good, no good. Yes. Uh, it's like me talking into my webcam, isn't it? It's, you, it's, it's right. It all somewhere. comes from... It's got, you've got to have, like, that self-belief to start with and just believe in it and to start doing it, and eventually, whatever it is, you'll get there, you know? Yeah. And... Did the BBC try to interfere with the narrative much? Did they try to shape it this way or that, or was it just not really that sort of programme? It did a bit on the first one. Uh, uh, sorry, it did It did a little bit. Um, on the second one more so, I would say, the second se- series that I did with them. Um, yeah, there was a bit more uh, of that going on. And, like, when you first go into TV you, or any kind of creative thing, Chris, you know yourself, you're like, you're quite precious about the work that you're doing and you think, well, no, I've got this vision. I want it to be like this and you fight for that and stuff. But eventually, like, I came to realise that um, I was a bit late to the party, really, realising this because I'm a bit dimmed up that way. But you realise, actually, you know what? What these people are saying is actually, they know their job really well and they're they're trying to tailor it to their audience. So just make it, you know, be more collaborative. And I wasn't, when I first started, I wasn't as collaborative. I was more you know, I still had that hard mindset of like, no, this will work, which is what you've got to have to get to that first place. But then you need to soften yourself and say, right, now I'm here. I need to collaborate and work with people and kind of take their opinions on board more without losing your own shape. And that's a skill in itself because you're either like from my training, probably similar to yours, Chris, it's like you're either taking orders or you're giving them. It's one or the other. You know what I mean? And then so to be the guy who's, you've gone from, you're like, well, no, I'm not taking orders now. I'm giving them um, in terms of, your, you, do you know what I mean? In terms of your, your physical training and your, your martial arts or your, your military background or whatever. So you, you, you get to a position of authority where you finally, the vision has worked and, and this thing's working and, you want, and you're still strong to that vision, but then you have to soften yourself a lot and really start taking on board like other people's, I know it's, mate, it's probably makes me sound like an absolute wanker, but it's not like that. It's like you've got a strong vision, hey, but you have to, do, you know what I mean? You've got to develop that skill set, Chris. Yeah? Mate, to, we to be do a whole podcast and it would be like a five hour one just discussing what you're saying because it's, I mean, I give you one example from writing. You know, my history until I did podcasting was writing for the previous 10, 10 years. Um, yeah. And there are so there is so much stuff to learn to be a consummate writer and publisher by yeah, publisher. Right. I don't mean necessarily like you've got your own publishing. I mean, to to understand the process of it all. Yeah. And there's a balance between your art. And what's going to sell. There's a balance yeah. between your you creativity go. and what needs to be edited. There you go. There's a balance between your morals and giving the audience what 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 they want. That for me, obviously, as a, as a, someone who tries to be a bit moralistic in my at least in what I what I you know put out on my YouTube channel, that's the hardest one. Is mm. you know. It, 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 I don't know if you ever notice I, in all my military videos or anything to do. I'm, I always want to explain both sides of the fence. You know, mm. I just want to explain the like what war really is and you know what conflict really is. And that's because I can't. I could easily have a channel just saying, "Oh, military soldiers are oh, they're the best people in the world. They're just all heroes." And 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 yeah, you know. And then bang, they're smashing this audience down on the, this enemy and bang, you know, 
it's not really telling the true story, is it? And <laughs> if I thought, I don't mind young people listening to my story and thinking, do you know what? I want a bit of that. I'll, I'll join them. You know, that, that's just life, right? But I want them to know that I have told you, right? Forget the freedom and democracy shit. That's just the rhetoric they tell you at the recruiting office. You know, you'll go in to massacre other teenagers and a lot of people will get very rich off it, right? You you need to know that that's primarily your role. I'm not saying that, you know, you might not, yeah, yeah. You might not be um, deployed in a peacekeeping, you know, a genuine peacekeeping capacity. But but when you look back at war and who's traditionally profits from it, it's not the people. <laughs> so the young kids so, involved. So I get it. I, I get it. I can see where... You know, you've had to compromise. I can see where it's like, uh, and it's mm. exactly the same with YouTube, Chris. Mm. You know, at some point you have to, I don't say take a knee, but it's the equivalent. At some point you've just got to just yeah. like take one for your own team and, it, and it's hot. And, you know, but if you're putting content out and no one's watching it and it's not working the YouTube out, there isn't much point yeah. being on that platform you've yeah. got to move yeah. you've got to move on and for me i balance it up a lot with saying well look i think overarchingly the message i put out helps young people you know yeah it yeah. helps them make sense of life you know sometimes yeah. it's brutally honest and not everyone's ready for that but it's that's just it it pisses me off if i'm watching something and you just you know oh, it's just i've just been like i've just been tricked into clicking this it's like i don't want to go there again in the future um, it just annoys me. So I think to have a genuine following is much more important than just having yeah. the numbers, you know. And, and it's interesting, you know, it, it, it just is interesting. And I think the problem guys like you and I are going to have to negotiate, Chris, is that we've got, we understand that our moral compass is intrinsically tied into our spiritual well-being. They, they're not mutually exclusive. The decisions we make in this life are what we will have to live with you know, not in eternity is not the right thing, but, you know, we have to live with under universal law. So, mm -hmm. you know, if I, you know, well, we, we just have to, and, and it becomes something that when you're working with other people, you then have to negotiate. Mm -hmm. um, for example, a YouTube producer wants you to be the most controversial, hateful, bitter, backstabbing. I'm not talking about my wonderful Ben here, by the way, although we have had, you know, conversations of this nature. Yeah. What What is the channel about? And and I get it. He's got, you know, yeah. we, we, we could make $100,000 next year He's easily, Chris, you know. Everything's in place to do that, but I won't do it because, you I'll know. Sell it now. It's like when the devil took Jesus up on the mountain and said, look around, all this is yours if you come and work for me. And Jesus said, you know, if, he said, if I come and work for you, I've got nothing. <laughs> it doesn't matter what I've got in material. You know, I've, I've compromised my, myself. And yeah, I was in a, um, just this is how kind of tired you get sometimes when you're on the road. I was doing a series for the BBC, Kick-Ass Miracles, and... Um, Looking back now, I'm so glad they edited this out because it's it's really stupid. But at the time, I was like, this is the fucking best thing since sliced bread. I was in a graveyard doing this piece to camera about, we'd just been like some of the graveyards in the Philippines, you know, they're like open. So there's a lot of, um, you know, bones and bodies and stuff like that. Um, and um, we've been, been in there for, I don't actually think it made, I don't think, I'm not sure, can't remember if that made it into the show anyway. But it was interesting because like people were living in the graveyard and um, for some stupid reason, Chris, I got it into my head um, that it would be good to quote Duran Duran lines from songs while I was doing this piece to camera. So I was like, you see, if you look around, if you look now all around, there's no sign of life. You know that song? You know, there's no sign. Of that, that, right? no and sign. I got it into but uh, yeah, I just got it into my fucking head, Chris. I was like, I think I was so exhausted. 90 days of filming. We'd been like, like 40, 50 flights. No, I think it was about 30, 40 flights in 90 days. Just exhausted, not sleeping, making really bad decisions. Like thinking I'm going to do some pieces to camera about something. 
you know, you just kind of kind of switch off and it all goes a bit dark. And I thought, right, I just started dropping lines from Duran Duran everywhere I was going. And thankfully, albeit Duran Duran is a very brilliant band from Birmingham, I think, um, they edited all, all that out, Chris. Um, so uh, you do start, you, you, you do, when you know, when you get into it, you kind of, yeah. So it's uh, at the time you're thinking, what do you mean? Why you, that, that is funny. It's, it's brilliant. And it's like, well, you're the only one that thinks that. I've got a Tai Chi franchise at the moment. So people who've been doing martial arts for a while can come and learn with me. Beginners can come and learn with me or people who've been doing it for a while. And what you find quite often is when somebody goes out to start teaching, um, when they first come out teaching, same as they first write their book or they get published or, or they go to publish something, they think that the world is going to come to them. So they're good people, but they just haven't been through the process before. And so they think that, well, as soon as you open your doors to teaching or you publish your first book, that you're going to get customers coming through the doors just because of who you are and you know your stuff and you, you know your, you, you, you know your content very well. But it doesn't work that way in the same way as martial arts. Like our guys need to go out and actually build the business as well. It's not just about opening your doors and, you know, it was that Kevin Costner film, build it and they shall come. It's nonsense, isn't it? It doesn't work that way. You've got to understand the business. You've got to understand the marketing. Chris, Bruce Lee, right? When I was yeah. in that bodybuilding gym in Hong Kong, when Bruce Lee came on the telly as it was, but we didn't have screens back then. We had televisions. Yeah. Bruce Lee came on on the national news or, you know, some some item, yeah. about, item about him in the media. Everybody in the gym just put down their weights and stared at this iconic legend of a man on the screen. What what can you tell us about Bruce Lee, mate? Oh, I'm a massive fan of Bruce Lee, like absolute legend, wasn't he? Um, he uh, he was a guy who um, I think like I think the two thing two massive things that he did were first of all like breaking into film right as an Asian man breaking into Hollywood in the seventies. I mean, it's how many Asian leads do you know now? Even now, you know, twenty twenty. So he was a dynamo, an absolute force of nature, right? So kung fu aside, so what he did for Asian people. Uh, was 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 incredible, and I think I think the figures are still to this day. His um, his last film, the Enter the Enter the Dragon, is still like pound or dollar for dollar the highest grossing film in terms of what they've put in and what they've got out. So um, it shows martial arts can make uh, huge amounts of money in the box office if it's done well, and it shows that um, you know the leads. The lead actors in Western films don't always have to be the blonde hair, blue eyed, eyed, eyed boys. You, you know, you can, there is diversity will sell. You know, if somebody's got charisma, they've got charisma. Doesn't matter what color they are. Um, so it, I think that was, I think that was massive. Right. And all of that came out of his martial arts, didn't it, Chris? He was um, he, like, in terms of his martial arts, he was a guy who um, broke away with tradition and he started taking the best, bits of what he could find at the time and integrating them. You could say he was the father of mixed martial arts. It wouldn't be a leap to say that, mate, because he was incorporating bits of judo, throwing techniques. He's like, well, Kung Fu stand-up game from Hong Kong hasn't got any groundwork. So let's take a bit of that. Let's take a bit of this. Um, I was just at his house last year. Um, and, and that was like massive for me. So I, my, my wife is American and we went over to, um, to see her family she's actually down in the south but we were over in california and we we landed in san francisco uh so we went and did all that thing and then when we left we had about a day left in san francisco so we went up to his old house in oakland the place where he first started teaching martial arts in america incredible mate it was one of his mates houses and here's the thing he'd already done a few films by this stage now, Oakland, it's expensive now, but it's not, it's a, it's a slightly downtrodden neighborhood in many ways. Um, it's out of town, you know, it's like probably about half an hour out of town. So it's in the suburbs. And he, it looked to me from looking at the structure of the house, like he was actually renting the top part of the house. Cause you can see like a separate sideway uh, entrance up and that's been there for a long time. If you look at the old photos as well. So he was so dedicated to his art, right? 
he's top of his game in terms of his martial arts, top of his game in terms of he'd made films. He'd already made films at that stage. And yet he was renting a roof section of his mate's house in a suburb um, of, of outside San Francisco. So he compromised an awful lot to keep focusing on his art and his film work. Um, Cause you know, as yourself, like when you're a dad, you want to do the, you want to settle down a bit. You want to do the best you can for your family. And if you're still running around chasing a dream, it's kind of quite hard. So um, on, on all of, all of his family, it would have been really hard. Um, so yeah, it was just inspiring to see that house and to actually, and I took some of the, I looked at some of the old photos you can find them on Google of him standing outside the house and in Oakland, California. And you're just like, that's it. Wow. They haven't painted that wall. Well, they changed the garage door, but you can, you can work at, you know, you can see this stuff in a young Bruce Lee um, in the first place that he taught. So yeah, just, um, I'm, I'm a huge, huge fan. Bruce Lee came along and he's this young, cool dude who's mm -hmm. very, very handsome, you know, yeah. Particularly handsome for for in 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 the way it transferred from being Chinese into yep. America. He's got this ripped body that just looks like he could, you know, he's, he's <laughs> yeah. toned like a race toned, horse, toned, it? toned to Home. perfection. Yeah, um, everything that came out his mouth was just so simple and yet so wise. Yeah, and of course, that, he's a bloody ninja at the old kung fu. Yeah, uh, he. He he must have changed. I mean, he made. I mean, he made being Chinese cool, didn't he? He did, mate. He totally did in a time period where you know the powers that be were not that way inclined. Um, in fact, I will tell you a story. You know, even recently, um, my wife's cousin um, bought a property in in uh, in New Mexico in Albuquerque in America. And I think there was something on the land contract that said no Chinese aren't allowed to buy it. It's obviously an antiquated law, but they hadn't they hadn't got up to date to getting rid of it. It was still on the contract, and you're thinking, like, what? How can this be possible? So, like, yeah, in in the psyche of of the Western people, it wasn't cool to be Chinese, and Bruce made it very cool. And he was very Chinese, wasn't he? You know, he he spouted off the philosophy. He did the Kung Fu. He was a badass. He took no prisoners. Um, for a lot of kids around that time, he, he's not, I mean, he is an icon, but, but he was also, he was like a guy who said, you know, you don't have to live in the normal way, man. There's another way to be. You know, you can get involved in this cool philosophy, get involved in these cool arts. You can be a man, you know? Um, and uh, yeah resonated i think and it still does now like 50 years after his death you know uh, wonderful, yes wonderful human being there's so much mystery surrounding isn't it there's been some i don't know how true they are but there's been some really good documentaries that have been out some yep. huh. had these kind of things like the last 24 hours of so and so's life i think they did one of those on bruce lee and right um, right, right. There was a lot going on behind the scenes, wasn't there, that we we didn't, as the public, didn't really understand. So there was, I don't know if I'm tarnishing his, his what's the word, his um, legacy. But, Reputation. You know, I think there was a bit of infidelity going on there. I think there was... Alleged, alleged. Alleged. A bit of wacky-backy chucked in the mix, which... Um, I think yeah. he started smoking when he he had disc problems, didn't he? He had very severe spinal problems. Yeah, he put his spine out as a uh, or disc problems as a lot of people have uh, in the martial arts. Um, and I think it was popular as well at the time, wasn't it? The wacky backy and all the rest of it. I think I think I don't know if I'm wrong here, but I think they found that in the toxicology report. Didn't not, they? That that from someone of my background, there's not a judgment call yeah. whatsoever. What I meant. No, of course. What I meant is it was a bit shocking for people that held him as this absolute idol, that this guy's perfect to subsequently learn, no, we're all human, unfortunately. And, uh, well, fortunately. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's good. And it, for me, it becomes interesting, going back to our conversation about what is art, is mm. you then start to see, ah, Ah, he had a stuntman for doing that backflip stunt because he'd broken his back, right? You know, he had a busted back. I get it now. And then your mind starts to think, 
I wonder how much of the film work was, you know, it was essentially stunt work. It, it, you know, he's yeah, not it's all choreographed. Yeah, all the fight scenes they wouldn't stand up in real life. They were just. It's just, uh, you know, dramatic stuff for TV. And I don't, I, he wouldn't have fought that way either in real life. You know, he's, he's fighting art that he developed. Jeet Kune Do is very, it's not, you know, it's not, it's not filmic. It's very direct. It's called the way of the intercepting fist for a reason. It's very direct. It's very quick. It's based on essentially like his Hong Kong Wing Chun style uh, at the time, which was very close quarter fighting. And uh, he added in bits and bobs from other, other stuff as well. It wasn't dramatic. It wasn't. You know, it didn't flail around and look wonderful. It, it was just about stopping people in their tracks, you know. What about the, um, you know, without compromising yourself, Chris, because um, I know you're a man that obviously knows lots of people in different places, but what about this route? There was a rumour he'd upset the triads. Which was there, By teaching the West, you know, the secret art of Kung Fu, was, was there any truth in that? Um, I think it's one of those things, again, like where there's some truth in it that's got mixed up historically over the sort of course of our, you know, our group memory, if you like. There's a couple of things going on. There's questions as to whether he was involved in um, in, in in any triad activity as a youth before he left Hong Kong. And that some people rumour that, um, in fact, his dad sent him to go study in America because he was getting into a lot of trouble. Uh, he was an energetic lad, you know, and he loved Kung Fu and he was out there and he wasn't afraid to tell people if he thought they were wrong, um, which is one of the amazing qualities about his, you know, his, his courage really as a human being, uh, in a, you know. Um, so I suppose there's, there's, that, there's that question. Um, and then I suppose the other thing that we're talking about is when he started teaching Westerners out in San Francisco, um, what exactly happened around the, um, the the Chinatown people? I don't know whether they were or weren't uh, members of organised crime. I'm not sure. It wouldn't surprise me if they were. Um, they tend to look after each other and band together, in, uh, especially in overseas mm. cities and Chinatowns. Um, They're called the, know, tong, as, the Tongs in America, aren't they? Yeah. As, uh, as a lot of communities have, the Italians have done exactly the same as well. You know, they bought some of their cultures and some of their like um, associations originally uh, to w when they've emigrated to different cities as well. So there's the question of, first of all, were they or weren't they? Uh, that's, that's still open-ended question, I think. But there was certainly, um, he experienced a lot of um, pressure from, from Chinese groups and martial arts masters at the time who didn't want to share the arts with Westerners. Um, and um, I, I think, like, again, historically, there's, there's probably reasons for that. Um, and he just flew in the face and he said, no, nah, no, nah, mate, I'm doing what I want. This is what I believe in. Uh, there's no difference between any people, it doesn't matter if they're white, black, Asian, whatever. They're all people and I'm not going to view them any, in any other way. You've got to remember, though, one thing. I think Bruce had some, I think it was maybe his grandfather or something was maybe German. Or his grandmother, or something. He had some. He had some European blood, um, and I suppose that may have influenced him as well to be more open-minded. But he was just like, "Look, I'm a martial arts master. I'm going to do what I want to do," mm -hmm. and um, you know uh, that resulted in him having some fights, um, which isn't particularly uncommon in martial arts circles. Um, it's how people they're martial artists. They like they fight. That's what they do, you know. Um, and sometimes things are sorted out that way if they can't be sorted out other ways. So he had, he had that to, to, to deal with, didn't he? Uh, in the, early, what was it, late 60s, early 70s, or whatever it was. Is there any um, truth, Chris, in, the, um, yeah. in the, the story that when they were filming, I think, was it Enter the Dragon, was in that big famous house in Hong Kong with the big grounds, like I think they probably would have been tennis court grounds, but they co-opted yeah. the, co them into the film as the, training ground on this secret island or whatever it was. Um, mm. And I heard a rumour that, or I saw in a documentary, that because all the extras in the Hollywood film industry have traditionally been um, triads, uh, the triads yeah. traditionally running the movie industry in Hong Kong, which isn't a secret anybody, <laughs> um, yeah. that 
that a lot of the extras in that End to the Dragon were gangsters, basically, you know, in, in the Brotherhood. And every time they had a break, one of them would want to, like, try his luck with Bruce Lee just to say, you know, I can have you, right? And so he, Bruce Lee would just say, okay, come on. <laughs> Let's see what you got. <laughs> I think so, mate. Yeah, I've heard I've heard those things as well. Um, that he was challenged on the set a couple of times and just just kicked ass. I mean, you know, that's what he did best, wasn't it? Really, he was incredibly fast. He was fucking lightning fast. Well, you uh, have to be if you're, if you're that small and light. It's like you say, you got to hit yeah. up with, with the fist. I mean, you're not going to grapple yeah. someone to the ground. Yep. You're, you're not going to... Um, no, you're right, mate. You've got to get in, in and out very quick, and that's what he was brilliant at doing. Mm. Just getting in, being very accurate, like precision strikes, uh, soft targets, boom, in and out, gone. So, yeah, I think, I think, um, I think, he, I think, yeah. I mean, people give you a lip, don't they? And, you know, you're dealing with rough, rough people. It happens. I don't think any hard feelings were, were out. Probably, he's probably quite gracious about it. Just give him a couple of licks and then, you know, picked them back up, shook their hand and dusted them off and mm. back to work, you know. And there was um, one documentary I watched that explained his death really well because there were lots of rumours around that. Um, I can't, I'll be honest, I can't remember what the summary was, but... It was an aneurysm, basically. He had a brain aneurysm. Yeah. Uh, for an allergic reaction, they think, to uh, analgesic, analgesic, so like an aspirin. Or paracetamol, we call them down in England. Yeah. So he, he he had a reaction to it, and he had a brain bleed, and that's what you were talking about. Um, was because he was found in another woman's bed. Um, uh, she was uh, she was an actress that he was that he was working with, and she was he was over there. They say working on some script ideas. He had a headache. She gave him some pills. He went to lie down in a bed. That's why he was found in a bed. Um, you know, that's. You know, and she didn't. That's what happened. She was hesitant to call the to call a doctor. I think because she knew he'd been smoking or something. And and of course, by the time the doctor did arrive on scene, there was some hesitancy. She, yeah, I think she called the producer first, didn't she? Was it That's Raymond Chow, oh, yeah. um, who was, I think, head of Golden um, Harvest Studios. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think with yeah, a lot which of is a bit of an unusual thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. If, well, it, 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 it's just that substance use was so taboo back then. I mean, it's taboo now, but, um, and then, yeah, right. Um, right. you know, it's, it's how many people have watched their friend die rather than just call a bloody ambulance, right? Because they're afraid of you know, some retribution, some repercussions, where in actual fact, the ambulance crew you just want to know what's, the pers- what's wrong with a person so they yeah. can save their life. Um, yeah, but it's a bit like the Michael Jackson situation, wasn't it? And also um, Diego Maradona, two people in there who were still under so much pressure to perform and still sought the adoration of the crowd. And both of whom, mm. both of whom actually took amphetamines to try to get their careers back on the go. So Michael Jackson was taking amphetamine to, to, to try to perform his dance routine as he had as a 21 year old but now he's 40 Diego Maradona yeah. was the same he when he was banned from the World Cup he tested positive for um, some form of amphetamine um, and it's it's sad isn't it because something that you understand you know why these guys wanted to be up there they you know they they a bit like Paul Gascoigne, isn't it? You know, they have this massive glory year or two, then they get beset by an injury or something and through no fault of their own, they have to take this step back and they have some down years and then they get the chance to get back on a horse again. And of course, you know, it's really tempting to want to, you know, put the odds in your favour, right? Uh, Yeah, I completely, you know, sort of understand this thing. And, but I heard a little bit similar thing with Bruce that, that, you know, his body was failing him, I think, because he was in his 30s when he died. Was, was he 40 yet? Yeah, I think he was, 
I think he was 32, 34, 32, something like that. He was young. Very, very young. But he'd over he'd overtrained as well, hadn't he? Yeah, that's he'd done it so intense, man. And it's like people say, Well, the more training you do, the better. And you, as a younger man, you know, you know yourself, you're like, you agree with that. You think, oh yeah, you just go all day, eight hours, nine hours, doesn't matter, whatever you've got to do. Um but you can't run a racehorse like that. The racehorse will die. Uh, or it will, you know, it will start malfunctioning. So I, I think I do think that it probably. I, I think I personally think that his 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 death was potentially caused by actually overtraining by training too much. Man, he put himself into the wall, wouldn't he? Did you know? That? No, I didn't. Put himself that. into electricity for dynamic tension, so your whole body tenses up. So your whole body goes really rigid. Like it's like doing weight training, but on acid, it's like you know, it's. Um, so I think he was a human being. He was a human dynamo. He had so much uh, power, personal like energy that he had to find an outlet. And um, he did incredible things in his short life. Had he lived longer, God only knows what he, what we would have seen from from him. A creative, an intellectual, a philosopher, a writer, a fighter. You know, he had it. He had it all going on. Film star, movie star. You know, as I think his his wife said at the end of one of the great. Uh, documentaries that was made about him she said I don't like to remember how Bruce died I prefer to remember how he lived once again on behalf of bought the t-shirt thank you ever so much Chris it's been brilliant absolutely and awesome thank you just stay on the line mate to our friends at home if you could please like and subscribe and click the little bell thing friends a lot of people are missing podcasts and going oh why did i miss that one and it's like if you don't click the bell you won't get a notification so please do massive thank you all for your continued support things are really firing off now and uh, that's because of you guys so much love to you all be like water <laughs>